Good morning and welcome to the 1001 service at the Union Church of South Foxboro. It's good to be with those of you who are here in person and welcome. And it's good to be with all of you who are tuning in online from wherever you are. God is wherever we are. So it's good to have you. And if you're watching later, it's, we're glad you joined us late. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may gather today. Thank you that you are present with each and every one of us, for you are always aware of who we are and what we're doing and, and all that's happening in our life. The very hair on our head is numbered. And Father, we pray today that you would receive our worship. We pray that you would be pleased to lead this service. We pray that you would teach us your way and we give you our thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today at 5 p.m. is our barbecue. Is it a barbecue if you don't use barbecue sauce? Is it a cookout? I don't know the difference, but at 5 p.m. today it's on the announcement it says it's our, bar our BBQ. So bring something you would like, grill, bring your supper, bring something to share, a chair and a blanket. A lot, most people have signed up. We have more people signed up than are in this room right now. If you haven't signed up and you would still like to come, I can tell you, because Renee's not in the room yet, she's actually prepared for extra people, so you're welcome to be here. 5 p.m. We're going to hang out and have some fun together. If you have not been baptized as an adult, as a follower of Jesus Christ, Sunday, August 25th, we're going to be doing baptisms. This week, I'm going to begin getting a hold of people who are interested. So if you are interested, please see me. Men's breakfast is this coming Saturday at 8.30 a.m. All men, there will be hash browns. In addition to the bacon, sausage, and eggs, I'm getting a cognitive test up here, <laughs> repeating phrases. But thank you for that. So all men are invited Saturday at 8.30 a.m. And Wednesday nights, we're doing a study on the book of Abraham. It's been a, a little summer study we've been doing. Abraham, one of the fathers of our faith. So uh, Wednesdays, you're welcome to join us in the fellowship hall or on Zoom. We're happy to have you. Pastor Stephen has a reading for us. Good morning. We are continuing our reading through the book of Luke, um, chapter 6, verse 39. Uh, it's on page 729 on the Bible in front of you if you're interested. Um, it's like the last paragraph. Last week, we began the first of several of Jesus' teaching throughout the book of Luke. Um, we pick up. He also told to them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes, or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good things stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do as I say? For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. 
the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, if you would please stand for worship. <clears throat> Yeah. 
two weeks to remember this one, but it, thankfully it's short. We, uh, our memory verse this month is Psalm 33, 4. Um, I'm going to go through it, and then we'll all do it together. And then next week I'll have lollipops for anyone who can remember it before service. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. Got that? All right, think you can do it with me. Okay, I heard a yes, so we're good. <laughs> For the word of the Lord holds true, we can trust everything he does. Psalm 33, 4. And now, uh, kids, let's go to Children's Church. Let's go have fun. We always spend a moment in prayer for some of the prayer requests that are on our hearts. Do you like, uh, I, I need to ask first of all, do you like good news? We prayed for some time for a little boy named Michael, six years of age, he might be seven by now, and in January we had a little uh, thanking of God because he ended his treatment, he got to ring the bell, and this week he had his six month checkup and Michael got to ring the bell again because they declared him to be cancer free. So we're so thankful to hear that. I've also had a friend, an anonymous friend, a classmate of mine who's been occasionally on the prayer list four years ago. Uh, he told me that he had stage four liver cancer. The doctor told him, I'm gonna be honest with you, you have a 4% chance of survival. Uh, this Wednesday, the same doctor said to him, you, have, you are now cancer free. And my friend texted me and said, you're right, there's a lot of power in prayer. So 
We have a lot to thank God for. We've been praying for Jill's mom, and her mom is better and is going home on the 15th, so we're happy for that. Uh, we had a prayer request from the 8 o'clock service, two prayer requests. One is for a young mom who is anonymous, but with a child in a very difficult situation that's going to be ongoing for some time. And I'm putting that on our prayer list at someone that I know. Um, we also had a prayer request for Margie Souza, a close friend of hers. Uh, yesterday lost her uh, son, who is a sergeant in our US, Arm US Army. Uh, he was on off time and was killed on his motorcycle. So we will pray for that family as well. Psalm 25 begins. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do, lot, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Heavenly Father, we insert ourselves in Psalm 25 with King David today, and we lift up our soul before you. We declare that in you and you alone we place our trust. And we pray today, Heavenly Father, that you who are wise, you who are majestic beyond human words, you who are perfect in all your holiness, you who love us, and because you do have given us your commands and have given us the guardrails of your word for what is best for us, we pray today to you, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Allow us, we pray, to walk in righteousness before you. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that before the beginning of time and eternity past, you created all things, including ourselves in your own image and likeness. And thank you that though we as a human family fell into sin before you, nevertheless, you came in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ, lived a sinless life among us. And because of this, you were worthy to give your life on the cross, Lord Jesus for the sin of all humanity, all inhumanity who would look to you by faith and would ask forgiveness. Thank you for the great things you have done for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your great mercy. And today, Heavenly Father, we thank you for answered prayer. We thank you that sweet Michael this little boy is now cancer-free. Thank you that for the second time he got to ring the bell and celebrate with his family and with the hospital staff. Thank you, Father, that you did a great miracle overcoming 96% of the odds that my friend is now cancer-free. May you continue to bless him that he might know you better and might continue to enjoy good health. We pray, Father, for the leaders of our country after the shooting last night. Thank you for your protection. Father, it is clear in your word and seems evident in events of the last few months that you seek to humble our nation and humble those who would be our leaders before you. Father, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, that they might be humble before you on their knees in humility and repentance as great leaders of the past in our nation have been. And Father, that our nation might be humbled and that we as a human family of Americans might recognize your truth and what you have done and be brought to our knees in gratitude and humility before you. Thank you that you are at work in our history as you have been in centuries past. Continue, we pray. 
We pray for the family of a 30-year-old army sergeant killed on his motorcycle. Human words cannot bring comfort. Thank you for your grace. We pray that your Holy Spirit would put his arms around them for good and even in this situation. We pray for a young mother who is in a very serious situation. Father, protect her and her baby. Father, bring them home very soon, we would pray. Be with Sam Law, who's been in and out of the hospital and has had in need of our prayers for serious health issue. Resolve it, we pray, that he might be working and, and active and able to care for his family. Continue to be with Allie's mom, who is in need of your touch after multiple knee surgeries. Father, grant that she would be free of infection. Grant that she would heal properly and be able to move on with her life. Continue, we pray, to be with Maureen, who was with us two weeks ago as she recovers from surgery. Grant her wellness. Be with Gail St. Clair. Thank you for her. She's a beloved part of our church family. Continue to heal her in body and grant her strength, we would pray. Be with Joanne McAuliffe, who may be watching this morning. We love her so dearly and pray that you might give her strength and mobility and that she might be able to stay at home with her daughters. Bless them for their care for her. Continue, we pray, to be with Kevin Gorney's cousin Michael. Thank you that he was able to attend a wedding in Vermont for his strength, his wellness, his beautiful family. Continue, we pray, as he is in long recovery and physical therapy after multiple health issues. May this young man, we pray, be well and strong. And Father, for George Sirikis, dear to our church family and his wife Lynn as George is now in the hospital beginning another treatment plan. Thank you that it has begun. Thank you that it, he is feeling well. Make it effective, we pray, for his health and well-being. Father, for those in addiction who meet here, even for those who were here on Friday night, continue, we pray, to so work that people would be looking beyond a higher power to your true Son, who is the key to all recovery and to all that is good. Grant blessing as you save lives in our midst, we would pray. And Father, we worship you today by praying as our Master Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Whose Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Should we just take a moment to pray for our offering? Heavenly Father, it is our privilege and your direction that we share a portion of what you have given us toward your work. For that portion that is given here at Union Church to support the work that is done here, we pray that it would be used for your glory, for your honor, according to your will only. And Father, that you would bless it as we share our gifts. And Father, may our hearts be in your work as a result of this, which is your purpose in our giving for our good. And so we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I should mention um, this morning at the eight o'clock service, I, I think it's okay to tell this, um, Jeff Kay, who many of you know, who attends the eight o'clock service, got up and shared at my request um, how 35 years ago this morning he woke up on the floor in his cellar 
a revolver beside his head because the night before in a drunken state with his wife and children having removed themselves from his life because of his addiction, he had planned to end his life and God intervened and a few days later he was in a detox and got down on his knees and said, I don't know who you are, God, or what you are, but I need your help and how that changed his life. So if you see Jeff K, congratulate him on 35 years today. It's his anniversary and we're very grateful that God intervened in his life and trust me when I say, because I see it firsthand, he has an enormous ministry in the world of young people who are in addiction. With, he sponsors men and he's also there as a safe person for young women, so we're grateful for God's work. Gratitude for what God does in our lives, whatever our story, God proves faithful again and again. We're going to be looking at a couple different passages today and you might want to turn to Luke chapter 1, if you wish to follow along, page 723 in the Bible in the pocket of the chair in front of you that looks like this, page 723 if you're using your phone. If you see me on my phone during uh, when Pastor Stephen is reading, I'm following along on my phone. It's Luke chapter 1, again page 723, but if you're using your phone, it's Luke chapter 1. We'll be looking at that in another passage also, and we're continuing our series on Through Women God. Through women, God has done great things. It's in the church as a whole. It's been true in the Union Church. Through women, God does great things. Many years ago now, I was asked to, to visit a lady at a retirement facility. I did not know her. I wasn't sure if she wanted me to come, but someone thought it was a good idea to have the, a pastor go to visit her. And um, since I've fooled people that I'm a pastor, I went. This lady was 103 years of age. She was very uh, astute and aware of what was happening. And I remember walking into her room and introducing myself and sitting down in a chair. And she looked back at me like she was as puzzled as to why I was there as I was feeling as to why I was there. But we began to talk anyway. And she told me the story of her life. She grew up in New Hampshire. She attended an Ivy League prestigious college. I wish I could remember which one. After college, she taught school for several years. Then she got married, and in that day, she explained if you got married as a woman teacher, you could no longer teach. She said that's so unfair, and obviously it was and has been done away with in our time. But since she couldn't teach school because of her husband's job, they moved to Florida. So she opened a gift store of some sort and tourist buses began coming to her little gift shop in this area where she was. It was so busy she could barely keep up. She hired people. She expanded her store three times. In Florida at a young age, unfortunately, her husband passed away wishing to restart her life and build new memories. She moved all the way kitty corner across the country to the state of Oregon, to the Pacific Northwest, to a cottage near the ocean. She said it was beautiful. I loved it there. She became friendly with some of her neighbors, and she really did begin her life anew. But when she got into her late 70s, early 80s, her only family that she was close to was a niece. So she bought a home on Thurston Street in Rentham, Mass, this side of Route 1, the little house that was just this side of you on the other side, the yellow house. She lived there. She told me a hilarious story about in the winter going up to chip ice out of her gutters. The ladder went out from under her, and she's 85 years old, hanging from her gutter. And some men were working on the street and heard her yelling and rescued her. It's amazing, is my point. She lived to be 104. It's amazing. We see people. We know little about them. But if you go below the surface, 
it feels like everybody has an amazing story and something very unique about them. Well, that is also true with the Bible. The cursory reading of it seems like it's just sort of difficult to follow, but if you get below the surface, there's a great deal of information. None of it was written in a vacuum. And we can actually learn so much more in our understanding of the Bible as we study it and the people in the Bible. And the Bible will come to life if we take the time and invest our time, like I ended up doing with Anne, with several visits, hearing her story. It will come alive and it will be rich and it will influence us and we will be the better for it. And we've been doing this series through Women God, and we spent some time with Deborah, and we've spent some time recently with Mary. And today is sort of a generalized look at some of the below the surface conditions of women in the New Testament time, in the Roman world, and in the Jewish world of the first century. And a keynote, not a text, but a keynote for today is John chapter 4, verse 7, where Jesus has strategically sat at Jacob's well. And he's waiting because he knows the Samaritan woman is about to come. And he says simply to her, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? Women were supportive of Jesus. Women played a role in the ministry of Jesus. And I'd like to think about the place of women in the New Testament time and women who provided for Jesus this morning. And to fully appreciate the place of women in the New Testament, we have to go below the surface. We have to think about the society of Rome, the society of first century Israel, and the place of women in it. And it's not always what we're told or a cursory look might lead us to think. So first think with me about a deeper understanding of the place of women in the first century. We're doing a lot of work. We're doing volumes and books in a, a few minutes' time without taking to know, getting to know the people of the first century. We often have kind of a flat view in terms of men and women, and the flat view goes like this. Men are dominant. Men make all the decisions. Men own all the property. Women are subservient and simply must do whatever the men command. Men dominate, men own everything, men control the money, men hold all the positions of power, they can move the family wherever they wish, or cheat on their spouse, and a woman has no power and no ability to hold them accountable or be part of decisions. That's kind of a flat view that we often have and we hear repeated about the New Testament times and understand it's true, it was a male-dominated society, and the Bible is primarily written by men, but women keep popping up. But there are other factors in the first century that enrich our understanding of the place of women in the ministry of Jesus and in the century when he walked among us. And there are several factors, but the one I'm going to mention this morning is the importance of social status. It's a, true that it was a male-dominated society, but there was also a thing of social status that put many women far ahead of the average man. If they were daughters of a powerful man in the political or military world, they would have high status and significant influence. If they were the daughter's wife or associates of a very wealthy man or a businessman, they would be people of status greater than the average man. Walking down the street, a woman of social status, and I'm going over a lot of stuff very quickly, if a woman of social status was approaching figuratively on a sidewalk, it would be the man who would stand aside to allow a woman of greater social status to walk by undisturbed because she would be more important than he is. 
If you were a man or a woman and you got an invitation to some event being hosted by a woman of social status, a woman of power and influence, a woman of uh, honor or wealth, it would be considered an honor to receive that invitation and likely you would do your very best to attend whether you were a man or woman or an important man, you, might, you would still want to go to that. There were women of status and ordinary women who ran businesses and were actually creating wealth, creating jobs, who controlled the family finances, who owned the family home because they had the business. They might have a palace, they might have an average home, but there were many women who had inherited property, which was true in that century. Any woman could inherit property, whether she was a woman of status or not. Many women were the owners of their home, and many women, whether directly or behind the scenes, had influence, if not direct power, in the society in which they lived. If the governor was making decisions, many wives of governors and men of influence had a role in their decision making and so on. So it wasn't a flat view that, like we often think it is, with men dominant, women submissive, doing what men say, there was social status and other factors that lifted up many women to places of prominence and influence. They helped to craft the laws of the Roman Empire. And many women of wealth were patrons. They financially supported the arts or charities or education. They paid for temples of pagan religions to be built and women of influence and wealth also supported an itinerant rabbi by the name of Jesus. In a nutshell, what we're seeing is in the first century, there was more space, more influence, a greater role from women than we often see in sort of a flat, one, one, you know, sort of one-dimensional view of the New Testament. Women were influential. Women had power. Women were important. Women often had status. And in Luke chapter 8, if you wish to turn to it, Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, page 731, page 731, Luke chapter 8, we see this in the Word of God, in the ministry of Jesus, we read, A.W. Tozer said there is never an error in the wording of the word of God. Every word matters. We read after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Now Luke says the 12, meaning his 12 central disciples, were with him, but he says no more about them in this context. But then he goes on, he says, and also some women who have been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Johanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, there's a woman whose husband had great power, Susanna, and many others. And then catch what it says here at the end of verse 3. These women were helping to support them, who is them, Jesus and the disciples, out of their own means. Jesus was supported and helped by women who traveled with the disciples, followed after Jesus, and were patrons of Jesus' ministry, supporters of his ministry. By the way, Magdalia, which is the reference of Mary Magdalene, Magdalia, the city, was a very wealthy trading city, and it's likely, we can't prove it, but it's likely that Mary Magdalene who's often portrayed in another way in the pages of scripture, was probably a woman of wealth and therefore could afford to travel with Jesus. So women, women had influence, women had high status, some in society. They had places of where they financially supported 
And in this case, the scripture tells us it was women who financially supported Jesus. So a deeper, a better understanding of women in, the, in their place in the gospel accounts. When I was four years old, it was a great year. And it was a great year because my sister, you may know her, went off to first grade. My father went off to work every day. So my mother and I were home, just the two of us. I had my mother all to myself. And I have distinct memories of being four years old, about 25 or so years ago, when I had my mother to myself and how we would play games, how we would go out in the yard and explore. We would follow a path out to what we called the swamp and there were high bush blueberries there. And uh, that was a big deal to a four year old boy who's loved the woods ever since. I remember the time I was naughty or I, I don't remember what I did, but my mother wanted to give me a swat on the derriere and she began chasing me and I, in the house, there's the living room, the hallway, the kitchen, the dining room. So I ran living room, hallway, kitchen, dining room, around and around with my mother chasing me. And eventually she ran out of breath and she fell on the couch laughing. And four-year-old Billy started laughing with her and I knew then I wouldn't be in trouble. It was a wonderful year having my mother at the beginning, early stages of my life all to myself. If we're blessed, we have a loving mother who's there to launch us in life. If we are blessed, not everyone is, but if we are blessed, we have a loving mother who launches us in life. And we spent two weeks with Mary, but the beginning of the life on earth with Jesus, for Jesus, was led by women. His birth events were led by women. Jesus was with the Father for all eternity. And as he prepared to enter the human form, God in human form, the Holy Spirit chose two women to put in leadership roles in the birth of Jesus. And a priest named Zacharias is visited by the angel Gabriel who says, your petition has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth, though she's Beyond childbearing years will bear you a son. You will give him the name John. Zacharias laughed, so the angel Gabriel silenced him for nine months until the baby was born. Gabriel then goes and visits Joseph and Mary and tells them that Mary will give birth. And if you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 1, this is a very familiar account to us. But Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26... The angel Gabriel comes to visit Joseph and Mary. In this case, in this, Matthew tells about the visit with Joseph. In this case, Mary, and in beginning at verse 26, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings. You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. That, by the way, means equal to. The Son is equal to the Father. God is coming to you, Mary. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. 
and the angel left her. Mary immediately yielding to the will of God in this situation. And we visited Mary recently, but Elizabeth and Mary are two women given the leading roles from, for biology, but also spiritually, to bring into the world the final prophet, John the Baptist, and the Savior, Jesus Christ, God in human form. And this is a pattern in the Gospel according to Luke. He particularly sends people forward again and again in his Gospel accounts in male and female pairs, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary. Jesus is eight days old. He's brought up to the temple to be dedicated. And when he's presented, Simeon blesses him, the man, followed by Anna, the woman who lives in the temple and is evidently a teacher. In Luke 13, a man plants a mustard seed in a parable told by Jesus, followed by a woman who is baking in the, in the next parable. A shepherd finds a lost sheep in Luke chapter 15, then a woman finds a lost coin in another parable, male and female, Jesus' parables. Jesus heals a man and then heals Peter's mother-in-law in Luke chapter 4. He heals a man, then a woman. Men race to the tomb after the resurrection, but only after the women have been there and informed them that the body of Jesus is gone and rumor has it he is risen, according to the angel. A, woman, a widow hounds a judge for justice in Luke 18 as an allegory of how we're to pray and never give up and be faithful in prayer. The biggest giver in the pages of all the Bible is a poor widow, a woman, Jesus says, who gives in Luke 21, 1 through 4, the equivalent of one-tenth of one cent. So a deeper understanding of our New Testament and the times in which it was written and life was lived finds many women of prominence and influence, of greater social standing and influence than the average man or the majority of men. It's not simply a flat idea that men are dominant, women are submissive, and the end of story. And then Jesus' life and birth story is led by women, and in Luke at least, he's presented again and again as speaking of men and then women, or doing something for a man and then a woman, always in pairs, a man and a woman. And lastly for today, Jesus clearly valued women in his ministry. John Lennon wrote a beautiful song entitled, Grow Old With Me. It's ironic, he unfortunately was killed five months later, but the words say, grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. When our time has come, we will be as one. God bless our love. God bless our love. More biblical probably than John Lennon realized. Jesus had no romantic intentions toward women. He's greater than. He's not a normal human. He is God in human form. But in the God sense, Jesus clearly loved and valued women in a godly way as we are to be toward one another in the church. In first century Jewish society, the pattern of a rabbi was that he gathered a group of men if he was a teaching rabbi, and he would have a school, that's where we get the word guild, a guild from a group of men who would follow the rabbi for a certain period of time, and they would live with the rabbi, they would imitate the rabbi, they'd be mimics, which is the root of the word disciple, and they would try to be like him and learn everything they could from his person and from his teaching. And a rabbi would not have a woman in his guild or his school. Women were not generally taught, though many were intelligent and studied with other women or on their own, but a rabbi would not have women. And if he was with his guild or school in a public place passing through, a rabbi might not even acknowledge a woman he knew in the marketplace because he was with the man, he was with the school. 
How different is Jesus? He's different from the rest of us in so many superior ways, right? So many ways we can look up and admire. We need no other hero. Jesus is strikingly above all the rest of us. And he notices and engages, for instance, the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 21 through 28. She's asking for her daughter to be healed, and Jesus tests her by being kind of callous toward her. Should not the, the food be saved for the children, not the dogs, he says to her. And she says even the dogs would get the crumbs. And he sees her faith, and he heals compassionately her daughter. There's the woman at the well who we began with in John chapter 4. That's a major happening. Jesus deliberately sits at the well knowing the woman is coming. And a woman from a despised people group, the Jews and the Samaritans, did not interact. But there's Jesus engaging this woman in a spiritual conversation, recognizing her intelligence and that she's searching. And he leads her to realize he is the Messiah that she has been seeking, who has been sent to the world. And he begins the conversation, will you give me a drink? As he reveals his need, it's now safe for her to reveal her needs, and Jesus helps her to do that. And he expresses a need so she feels safe. There's the striking story of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, with whom Jesus is remarkably merciful. And she responds to Jesus, who writes something in the dust, and her accusers, beginning with the oldest, leave one by one. We're never told what he wrote. I think he was writing the names of the men's girlfriends, and they dared not say a word, because how did he know that I... And so they left one by one, but we do not know what he wrote. But we notice that the woman, who could have bolted at some point and hidden in a place, to get away from her humiliation, instead stays where beside Jesus. Her safe place becomes Jesus in that interaction. Again and again, Jesus notices women, teaches women, unlike the rabbis who had men following them. He had women traveling with him also. He's never condescending. He's always respectful. He's always gentle. He shows love, respect, and that he values the women around him, strikingly so in the day and age in which he lived. He recognizes that women, as Paul later puts into word from the teaching of Jesus, that men and women are made in the image of God, which we're told in Genesis 1. And Jesus gives his life on the cross to redeem women as well as men. I have a friend, he's not from Union Church, who if I thought it would do any good, I'd tell him to knock this off, but he sends me, he sends me jokes about women. Why should a man only marry one woman? Because he can't serve two masters, the Bible says. Why couldn't Helen Keller drive a car? Because she was a woman. What are mixed feelings? Watching your mother-in-law drive your favorite car over a cliff. These are supposed to be funny. I don't think they are. God made women. He loves women. If we understand our New Testament and we go below the surface like I did with Anne, 103, 104 years old, we see amazing things. And going below the surface in the Roman and Jewish world, it isn't simply a flat truth that men were dominant and women were subservient. It was very different than that. Many women had influence, money, power, status, far beyond most men. And Jesus came into the world and God partnered with women as well as men, with both, 
bringing Jesus into the world, God himself in human form, entering his creation through and with the help and with the guidance and so on of women. His resurrection was notable because women were the first witnesses. And all through his ministry, as we carefully, as I hope we do, read and reread and reread the gospel accounts, Jesus loved and valued women every bit as much as any man. What is the application of this to us? It's to be like Jesus, right? It's always to seek to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to leave behind my old nature and seek to be like Jesus. So this week, our assignment to work on is to be like Jesus toward the women in our life and show our love and express it and our respect and that we value them. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word because it corrects everything in the human heart. In every way, it corrects our sin nature. And Father, as a man, I feel within me and I have felt that male pride, but Heavenly Father, all pride is sin before you. Father, so work by your Holy Spirit in my heart and our hearts. I pray that whether we are a man or a woman, we will recognize your work. We will love and value the women among us. And in doing so, we will experience gratitude for your work and your blessing on our life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to everyone who has been here in person today. It's great to have you, all of you. You're invited back at 5 p.m. for the cookout if you're able to make it. For those of you who have joined online, we're glad to have you as well. God is wherever we are. Through women, God, through women, God has done great things, and we can be thankful. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours in abundance. Amen.